Dr. Sunita Narain is a writer and environmentalist who uses knowledge for change. She is Director General at the Center for Science and Environment in New Delhi, India. And the Center for Science and Environment is a public interest research and advocacy organization that researches, lobbies for, and communicates the urgency of development that is both sustainable and equitable. CSE's claim or aim is to raise concerns, participate in seeking answers, and more importantly, in pushing for answers and transforming these into policy and therefore practice. In 2005, the Center for Science and Environment, under the direction of Sunita, was awarded the Stockholm Water Prize, that's very impressive, for its research and advocacy to create new thinking on how traditional systems of water management, in particular rainwater harvesting, once rejuvenated, could become the starting point for the removal of rural poverty in many parts of the world. The work of CSE has highlighted that water cannot become everybody's business until there are fundamental changes in the ways we do business with water. Sunita has also been featured by Time magazine as one of India's most influential people, and in 2005, and again in 2008 and 2009, she was included by foreign policy as one of the top 100 public intellectuals on earth. We are very, very pleased to have her here to speak with us today. Sunita? Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you, Bob. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, um, Marianne, for all the, all the logistics, all the arrangements you've made for me to be here. And I'm really delighted to be with all of you and to give you a sense of the, um, the water challenges as we see it in our world. Do you want to move this? Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> um, so I'm going to speak today and you know, before I was, I, was, I was preparing myself, I was sort of wondering what I would say to an audience in Canada, in Waterloo, where water is a very different issue. And um, your water challenges seem so far away from where I come from. They seem to be all fixed and all sanitized and all clean. And I, I, I was sort of wondering what I would actually, would I, make any sense to any one of you when I spoke about the water challenges in my world, which is very complex and quite a mess. Uh, and when I was, and, and, I, and I must say this today, being here with you has, um, has informed me and enriched me of the discussions and the dialogues that you have here as well. And I would like to congratulate um, all of you and the posters that I saw. I think um, uh, what I saw in the posters was enormous relevance, enormous depth, and an ability to capture the complexity of water, which is uh, so important. Uh, the conversation in the morning uh, session on the First Nations uh, told me that you have very much a South in Canada as well. And uh, it is very clear that the kind of issues that we were discussing in the morning are the issues that we are talking about in India and the answers that we need to jointly find. So in that sense, as Susan mentioned that in the morning, bringing um, her, um, the villages from Africa together, and I think it would be enormously important to make that bridge because we need to be able to find solutions together. And it is my belief that if we can find the solutions, we will be able to better inform the rich world and its water use, which I think is quite often very senseless. And it only works because the rich world has a lot of money. But it isn't very sensible in the way it manages water. So what I'm going to talk about is water security in the poor's world and how today we need to inform the research and policy agenda to manage both scarcity, increasing uh, pollution and waste, but all in an age of climate risk. And I want to say this because I'm coming, 
at a time from India when every day in the paper you are getting tragic stories of how farmers are committing suicide. And farmers are committing suicide because we've had huge problem of unseasonal rain this last four to five months. We've had hail storms, we've had freak storms, um, which have destroyed crops over millions of hectares. And you literally have grief, despair, and desperation today on the face of huge number of people in my country. And it is time we recognize that there is something happening that what we are seeing today, which Indian meteorologists call the Westerlies, the Western disturbance which is becoming so frequent and is leading to so much unseasonal and freak weather is not normal. That this is, you cannot say if this particular season of despair is linked to climate change. But it is also very important for us to now say more openly and more bluntly that these extreme weather events are climate change. So you cannot say that these weather events are not climate change anymore. So even if one individual event is not because of climate change, the growing intensity, frequency of such events is clearly linked to climate change. And more devastatingly, we need to be able to understand that normal is weird, is now normal, and normal is now devastating. And the worst indictment that I think any one of us could hear is that the poor who are not responsible for climate change are its victims today. It is consumption of societies like yours, and Canada certainly does not have a very good track record in terms of managing and being leaders in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. But my own country, as it gets richer, and the middle class in India will contribute to emissions, but the victims of our excesses are the poorest in the world. And that is something that we need to remember as we see the issue of, um, as we see the faces of the people in despair in my part of the world. And in this age of climate risk, we need to understand, I often say this, and I say this with greater amount of awareness and greater and more acute sense of, of, of concern. Um, in India, the finance minister is not the gentleman who sits on the chair as the finance minister. The finance minister in my country is the monsoon. And water security or insecurity is already high. It's already crippling. But in a situation where you have greater variability, you have greater unseasonal rainfall, what do farmers do? How do they then manage scarcity, unseasonal and variable rain events, extreme rain which lead to flooding? And this then becomes a huge agenda for all of us as water managers to try and understand how would you inform both the policy and the politics of climate mitigation, but most importantly, how will you inform better the practice of agriculture in our countries so that it can better cope with these unseasonal uh, rain events. And so in some senses, the agenda for water, the, the water future is as follows. One, the management of competing demands in this time of scarcity between agriculture and industry and urban areas, the new growth areas for, for water use, the management of risk, which is untimely and deficient rainfall, and the management of pollution, which is ensuring that water is not degraded and so becomes unusable. 
those become the most critical water agenda for our world as we go forward in the future. The most important is to manage competing needs. In, in India, water will not follow in where people move. In the rest of the world, not Canada, but I know in many rich industrialized countries, particularly in Europe, most water is used in urban and in industrial areas. And the reason is very clear. People have moved, industry has moved, economies have moved, so has water. But the transition of moving water to where economies have moved will not happen in countries like India. The reason is large parts of India will remain dependent on agriculture. Even in 2050, it is predicted, even as India urbanizes, even as we industrialize, large parts of livelihoods, employment, where people get their daily wages from will be dependent on agriculture. And it is this livelihood connection to water that will become critical to protect. So even if agriculture continues to use a substantial amount of water, it will become important, it will stay important because it has such large numbers of people who derive their daily survival from it, their livelihoods from it. And currently 60% is dependent on agriculture. It's predicted that even in 2050, it will remain at about half, 50%. But it is in this same situation that we will have cities and industries grow, and we will need more water for growth as well. So unless we manage the competing needs, the reallocation of water between agriculture and industry, between the current users of water and the new users of water, unless we manage this carefully, prudently, we will see more and more violence. Already in India, we have seen instances where there has been violence, where there has been police firing, where farmers have protested their water being taken away for supply to cities. And this will grow if we are not able to manage both the water for agriculture and water for industry and urban areas in a way that we can grow, we can prosper, but we become a much more water prudent society. And that then becomes the real agenda for competing water needs. If you look at the data that in, in, in India, um, water data is often rather uh, poor in terms of its um, estimation. And the last data that we did put together was in 1999, in which we, we said that India would really remain um, uh, largely water would remain with agriculture uh, even in 2025 when the estimation was done. Irrigation was estimated to use about 90% of the water, would continue to use about 73% of the water um, in this uh, changing scenario. But all this underestimates, severely underestimates the the growing need for water in urban and industrial areas. And the reason is often that water um, planners, water people who work on water essentially come from, in my world, come from irrigation backgrounds. And so they have really looked at agriculture and they understand agriculture, but they don't understand the growth of other sectors which will demand water as economies grow. Our own study, which we did only for certain industrial sectors, found that water use, water consumption would actually double in this, in this decade that we looked at. And that's very clear that as most country water data will show, 
as industries grow, as cities grow, your water use is bound to grow. And what happens then in a countries where water is still needed for basic survival needs for agriculture? And so if you're serious about this, the management of competing needs, as well as the management of risk in agriculture, then the first clear challenge is to augment water supply, to make sure that water for agriculture is sec secured. But if you want to do this, then you also have to recognize that it is not surface irrigation, but really groundwater, which provides the bulk of irrigation in our parts of the world. And you have to recognize that the decisions over groundwater are not made by bureaucracies, but made by individual well owners. The last minor irrigation census, and remember because of the colonial legacy we have, we still call surface water irrigation as major irrigation. We call well water irrigation as minor irrigation not recognizing that the world has actually changed, that today the bulk of irrigation comes from groundwater, the bulk of drinking water comes from groundwater uh, extraction. So the minor irrigation census in India found that there were 19 well, million well owners. So they take the decisions on water. It is also very clear that there are, they are efficient in use. But the fact is, the crisis of groundwater depletion is growing. The crisis of water scarcity is growing because we are abstracting much more than what we are replenishing in, for, in our groundwater system. And as a result of it, you are getting to see more and more risk in in, in agriculture, in water use, you're also getting to see more and more scarcity, which is leading to, um, um, to violence. So if we recognize groundwater, and that's a major change in the way we look at water management, then you would recognize the need for recharge. You would recognize the fact that large reservoirs centralize recharge. But what you require is decentralized recharge systems. And that rain is actually the most decentralized rainwater system, the, the most decentralized water system that you could ever have. And that rain is decentralized. And what you need then is to find a way in which you could actually use that decentralized system so that to recharge well water. If you look at this data, and you can extend it across the next decade, even in the last decade in India, there is more um, irrigation that groundwater provides than surface water. And this is not just conjunctive with surface water systems. This is just groundwater irrigation is huge in terms of uh, farmers finding that is the most secure system for pr increasing productivity. But the problem is that all structures for decentralized recharge have gone. So if you look at that same, the wells, the number of wells have increased, the number of the area irrigated by well water has increased, but the area in irrigated by tank water continues to go down and tanks were the perfect sponges. They were the recharge systems which were decentralized um, in nature because they were, they were decentralized, they were disaggregated, they captured rain, they, they recharged groundwater where water falls. And this is recognizing that water flows very fast. Out of the 8,760 hours in a year, most of India gets rain for about 100 hours. Now think about this in the age of climate change. Just think, as rain gets more variable, as rain gets more extreme, 
What science, scientists are predicting is that we will get increased precipitation, but that rain will come in even fewer number of rainy days. So in all across South Asia, you will get more rain, but in fewer number of rainy days. You only have 100 hours of rain. And in an age of climate change, you will begin to see more rain in even fewer number of hours, which means that the only solution we have in our world is to extend the monsoons, to capture, store, recharge, and then use that rain over dry periods. And to do that, we need to learn from the traditions that we had in our country, in our region, which actually were based on looking at both ecological diversity and using that one principle of catching water where it falls. In 1997, we published a report called Dying Wisdom, where we looked across India and we found this enormous diversity, technological sophistication, where every region had its own system to hold capture rain. And the principle was catch water where it falls. This was an artificial catchment built in the desert with a well in the middle and that one hectare of land with, a, with 100 millimeters of rainfall would give you a million liters of water. So every roof was a rainwater harvesting system. Every, every place where you could capture the water, you did and you stored it. And every region of India had its own diversity. So if you went to the cold desert, they used a remarkable system of springs, of glacier melt, and large irrigation systems which conveyed water off the glacier. If you went to Rajasthan, the, the dry desert, it used both the runoff of local catchments into tanks, the overflow of that into step wells and made every, every rooftop a rainwater harvesting system. If you went to other parts of Rajasthan, they used moisture recharge as a way of, um, of, um, of uh, um, increasing productivity. Or in the Indo-Gangetic Plains, they had a remarkable system of canals, dry canals, to channelize flood water so that when the flood came, you did not tie your rivers down. You actually let your rivers flow into catchment, into drainage systems, which in turn recharged groundwater. So you did not bind your rivers, you actually celebrated the flood water and you used the flood water to build a water secure uh, post season. And then of course the cascade tanks of South India, which are engineering marvels in which one tank is, is linked to the next. So a remarkable system of, of using traditional knowledge of, um, to build a water secure um, country. In the new age, obviously, this traditional knowledge needs a place. We need to build millions of such water recharge structures. India has an employment guarantee program in which we put money to uh, we pay people labor to invest in building assets. What we need to do is to build durable assets, ecological assets, so that we can build huge numbers of such decentralized systems to manage water risk uh, in the future. But this is not going to be enough. If we are really serious about managing water and coping with climate change, then you will also have to link water with resilience. And if you're serious about resilience, you will have to turn the word resilience around so that it actually means something quite different from what we are beginning to make it believe, to make it mean today. Resilience means to actually build 
increase productivity at low cost. Because the higher the cost, the higher the risk, and higher the loss. So what you need to do is to build affordable systems of, of agriculture and not industrial systems of agriculture which increase cost to farmers and therefore increase the loss as we are beginning to see in India today. One unseasonal rainfall and you have farmers deep in debt because of the huge loans that they've taken to increase agricultural productivity. So in a climate risked world, resilience will have to be reinvented. It will have to mean that you can actually do much more with much less. You will need to think about systems in which you use multiple crops, crops that are water resilient, systems of agriculture that can increase coping ability of farmers. Well, all that will also mean that resilience is not about technology, it is actually about lifestyles. Because if water is about cropping systems, then water is also about the food we eat. And then we also have to recognize that diets are about the food we are sold. If any one of us who comes from India will tell you that most of us have only begun, if we come from North India, as I do, we have only now begun to eat rice. We never, we never ate rice because rice was not ecological in our part of the world. We were an arid ecosystem. We would grow wheat, we would grow millets. Millets are water prudent crops. And today we eat white rice, we eat polished rice, we eat rice even though it is the most water wasteful crop in an arid region where I come from. It's an excellent crop in regions where they have very high rainfall like in South India in Kerala. Rice improves recharge of groundwater. Paddy growing improves recharge, but it's a terrible crop to grow in my region. And yet we grow it today, we eat it today. It's the only thing we eat because global diets are today being transformed by companies, by industries, by lifestyle changes in which what we eat today is becoming so universal so, so, so less diverse. And so this link has to be made. We need to be able to link resilience, not just with technology, but also with the nature of food industry in this climate risked world. And these then become all the different linkages we need to bring into our water agenda, into our water research so that we can make sure that all these words don't, don't become newfangled systems which uh, people become more divorced from. The second issue obviously is agriculture, as I said, has to become much more resilient. It needs to cope better by augmenting its water system. It needs to be able to use more decentralized systems of water management. But then the other part of it, the flip side of it for us, is the urban industrial water challenges. And this is an equally severe and an equally critical water challenge for us. We need clean water supply for all. We need to take back the waste that is generated by water use because the third part of the water challenge is to make sure that we do not pollute water, we do not degrade the available water so that we have even less to go with. And we need to treat the water so that it does not pollute. And we need to do this in a way that it does not add to water conflicts. So how does the urban industrial water management system work in, in the coming years? Two years ago, I worked on a book called Excreta Matters. 
We looked at 71 different cities in India and we asked a simple question. Where does your water come from? Where does your waste go? And it was very fascinating because uh, India being India, we know about water, but we know very little about where our waste goes. And it took a lot of effort to get all this data out and to understand um, a, a, a countrywide picture on what was happening with our water system, what was going wrong with our water system so that we could not supply clean water to all in our cities anymore. And most importantly, we were polluting and destroying our rivers. What was happening? What was happening that was so wrong? And what did we need to do to fix it? And that really is something that I, I, I feel very strongly about because as much as I believe we can fix doing things differently in the rural agriculture um, area, I think it is even more, it is much more difficult to fix what we will do in urban and industrial areas because there the paradigm of water management is so heavily dictated by the engineers, and many of you are engineers here, uh, by engineers who have built so many sewage treatment plants over the years that they are so wedded to that technology that they are not prepared to look beyond to find a new system of water management and waste management. So I often say that what you have is two political economies that we need to understand. The political economy of water supply and the political economy of defecation. And in both those political economies, the systems of water waste management are not affordable and equitable. And because they are not affordable and equitable, they are not sustainable. So sustainability in our world has to do with whether a system is equitable and for it to be equitable, it needs to be affordable. And this is something that we learn very sharply when you look at our water supply. If you look today at the way Indian cities are managing water, our water is supplied is sourced from further and further away. It leads to increasing uh, um, losses, distribution losses. And as a result of it, you have less water to supply at the end of the pipeline. You have less water to supply at the end of the pipeline means more costly water. Cities are not able to recover the cost of supply. And because they cannot recover the cost of supply of water, they have absolutely no money to invest in taking back that water and in treating it before disposal. So they have no money to invest in sewage. When we looked at the 71 cities, we looked at where the water supply was coming in the past, how far was it from the city, and in the past, all water supply was within the city. As time went, cities went further to get their water. They built reservoirs to bring water into the city. And as time is when they are planning for the future, they're going even further out to bring their water. So the length of the pipeline is only increasing. In each one of our cities, when you start drawing such maps, you find that a city like Bangalore, for instance, had tanks inside the city which supplied it water. The first step was to go 18 kilometers to bring its water. Now Bangalore gets its water from 100 kilometers where it, it, it has to build a pipeline to bring it. Happens city after city. And as a result of it, the cost of water supply is increasing, the cost of energy, which is very high in our part of the world, uh, the cost of energy in providing that water supply is increasing. In every municipality water utility we looked at, 
we found that the cost of energy was becoming a bigger and bigger component of water supply, and they were just finding it almost impossible to be able to supply it. And remember, the longer the pipeline, the higher the distribution losses that happen. So lesser water, more expensive water. What we also find is that in this paradigm, even though we have enough water to supply on a per capita basis, every city, more or less on an LPCD basis, on a liters per capita per day basis, had enough water per capita. But water doesn't reach all. And this intra-city inequity is huge and growing. But when you look at intra-city inequity, we often don't relate it back to the fact that we have adopted technologies which are so capital intensive, which are so resource intensive, and it is so expensive to supply to all. So as I said, you have a water supply system in which you have very high distribution losses, your cost of supply goes up, you cannot supply to all. So if you look at my own city of Delhi, uh, when you look, and this is official data, the place where the more powerful people live, uh, and it's not just about power, it's about the fact that it's even closer to the water supply uh, inlet point for the city, the amount of water supplied is 462 liters per capita per day, where the Indian parliament is. And in outskirts of Delhi, because the length of the pipeline to bring it from the north of Delhi to the extreme south of Delhi, that pipeline has to run. By the time it reaches the very south of Delhi, the pipeline is either broken, there isn't enough water to supply, it's down to 30 liters per capita. And in this scenario, what is also happening is that you're getting groundwater, which is used more and more because water supply doesn't reach all. And so people have no alternative but to move to groundwater. But this is not accounted for because officially cities account only for what they officially supply. Millions depend on private wells, tankers, bottled water, but there's no recognition of this. And as a result of it, there is no management, no respect for its management. What we did was very simple. We looked at whether groundwater levels in, Indi in Delhi were declining, and we superimposed on it the water inequity map. So if you take the water inequity map and you superimpose on it the groundwater map of the city, you find that groundwater is declining fastest in areas where official water supply doesn't reach. So it basically helps you to do a quick mapping of where both intra-city inequity is, but also the link with the use of groundwater. But because we don't recognize groundwater as such a critical source of water supply, remember the agriculture story, it's the same here, the recharge is neglected. So cities value land, but cities don't value water. And there's no legal protection for city lakes or for catchments of our drainage systems. And as a result of it, sponges of our cities get destroyed. And with climate change, you will get more extreme rainfall events. You will get more rain, as I said, fewer rainy days. And so today what happens is if it doesn't rain, we have a drought. If it rains, we have an urban flood. We've lost the sponges to capture the rain and to recharge it at, for scarcity. We've lost our ability to think about decentralized water supply systems, even for cities. In Mumbai, we had a terrible flood. And if you look at the rainfall that happened in the city, it was abnormally high, but it also had no place to go. So when it rained, you had this massive flooding, which led to huge losses of people because all of Mumbai today is built up and all its sponges have been eaten up. And as I said, part of this water story in our cities is that water equals waste. Yet cities spend on water, 
and have no money to spend on cleaning up waste. 80% of the water we know leaves our homes as sewage, so more water means more waste. Yet interception of sewage is expensive, treatment of sewage is even more expensive. And current technology of sewage management has been invented in countries and regions which have a lot of water, like Canada, and a lot of money. And so you take a little bit of human excreta, you use water to flush, you take water to convey, and water to dispose. You take investment in building infrastructure for piping, for, mump, for pumping, and for continuously upgrading sewage treatment facilities. We just had this fascinating talk about artificial sweeteners in our water supply system. And what that tells you is that as societies become more and more chemicalized, you will have even greater um, um, contaminants in your water, but more expensive to clean as well. Fecal matter is the simplest contaminant to clean. Yes, it's pathogens, yes, it can kill, but it is cheap and easy to clean. But the current technology of sewage management is built on staying behind the problem. So you keep polluting, you keep investing in building more and more expensive sewage treatment plants to clean more and more smaller and smaller um, contaminants. This is not a technology for us. We don't have the money to be able to build large infrastructure that is needed. Um, we do not have even the ability to be able to collect the waste and to be able to convey it. So the first count that was done in India was as recently as 2011, when we actually connected the toilet to our wastewater conveyance system. Till then, our census was collecting data on sanitation by just looking at the fact that if you had a latrine or a toilet, and whether it was a pit latrine or whether it was a water closet. But in 2011, we um, spoke to the census authorities and we said that it was more important to connect the receptacle to the conveyance system and ultimately to the disposal system. So for the first time, you got data which said that this is for urban India. You understood that 72% of urban India is connected, a toilet is connected, but 32 is connected to a piped sewer system, 38 to a septic system. Now, of that 32% which is connected to a piped sewer system, let's be very clear, most of those pipes were made at a particular time where they could be old, they would be in various stages of disrepair, we have not been able to maintain them, and then you have a huge growth that is happening where you have to keep building urban infrastructure at a scale and a pace that the world has never seen before. Most of Indian cities do not have underground sewerage network. So they cannot convey the waste, they cannot intercept it, and they cannot take it to a treatment plant. And the huge backlog that you have you cannot fix by saying you're going to lay those pipes and the problem will go away. If you take the city of Bangalore, uh, which is um, the sort of high-tech city of India, um, it has 3,610 kilometers of sewage pipes. It also, because it's very high-tech, it has every kind of technology that is used in its sewage treatment plants. So every kind of Modern technology exists from, an, uh, from a membrane blaze plant to every other plant that you would want, and it has the ability to treat 781 million liters per day, and it generates about 800 million liters. So you would think, wow, this is a city which can actually treat its waste. There's no problem here. But the fact is the city only treats 300 million liters because the rest of the waste does not reach. 
The city now needs to build 4,000 more kilometers of underground sewerage network. And remember, in 100 years, it has built 3,610 kilometers. So it builds, it grows, more lines are needed for repair, and this catch-up game never works for us. And as a result of it, what you get is partial treatment. Cities cannot control pollution because the cost of building these systems is very high. We build sewage systems for a few. We spend all the money to pump, to repair, and treat the waste of the few. But the treated waste of a few gets mixed with the untreated waste of the majority. And the result then is pollution. I said right at the beginning that for us, the challenge is equitable, inclusive growth. Only then can it be sustainable. And in this current model, you can only meet the water needs of a few and then the sewage treatment needs of a few as well. And as a result of it, full costs are not affordable. I hear this debate all the time in water planners that whether we should privatize or whether we should not privatize. That isn't even the beginning of the question in our world. The question is to build a paradigm of growth which is uh, affordable and so sustainable. The water, sewage, pollution costs today are so high that they are unaffordable by all. And so you cannot pay the full costs. You cannot think of building systems in which you can pay the full costs and so you cannot think of having simple privatization models in which somebody will come, somebody will take the waste away, somebody will treat it, and your rivers will all be clean. You have to think about a model of water and waste which is cheaper, technology is much more affordable. And that really takes us to the biggest challenge we have today of how then will we clean our rivers. Today, the Indian government has decided, and it's time it did, that we need to clean our rivers, and it's going to start with the Ganga. Um, but the fact is that our river cleaning is so linked to the model of sewage and water management that we will adopt in our countries. Rivers will need water for ecological flow. Today, most of our rivers Water is taken for agriculture, water is taken for industry and for cities, and what we return back is only waste. So if you need to clean rivers, you will have to reduce the abstraction of water for agriculture and for cities. You will need to provide water in our rivers for assimilation of waste. You will need to provide water for ecological flow. So that really then links back to how will you manage your water supply, and if you can provide alternate ways of being able to provide water for your cities without having to tap into rivers. Water supply must also be affordable, as I said, so that cities can invest in sewage. And in all this, if we want to clean our rivers, waste management must be redesigned so that it can intercept, treat, and dispose of every drop of waste without building the underground sewerage networks that modern cities are so proud of. And this then becomes the agenda of living downstream. So what do we have to do? The following. One, Plan deliberately to cut supply, cost of supply. Spend on sewage, not just on water. Cut costs of sewage systems. Plan to recycle and reuse every drop. And connect water conservation to sewage. So the first agenda is to cut costs, to cut the length of the pipeline for water supply and for waste management. 
And if you're serious about cutting costs, then you have to cut the length of the pipeline. To cut the length of the pipeline, we again need to get back into the systems of the past to invest in decentralized sources of water, in decentralized recharge of groundwater. And for this, we need to value traditional systems. We need to build and improve on them for future water supply. So we cannot discount the knowledge of the past. We will have to build on it for the modern water supply systems of the future. And we need to do this because we will have to cut the costs so that we can supply to all. Two, we need to, be, to reduce water use itself, which means that we cannot first become a wasteful society and then learn the value of water efficiency. Most of India today is a bucket society, but we are moving to becoming a shower society, a water shower society. So how do we make sure that we can make Indian and all other societies, such societies, promote water prudent cities and water wise societies, which means that you start measuring your water um, in terms of how less, how much less you use, not how much more you use. The third agenda is really to plan for sewage. And in my view, water, not water, but sewage must be our obsession. We must cut the costs of sewage and that may force us to reevaluate technology, to design for affordable solutions. We need to plan for sewage treatment now. And in that, we need to plan differently. We literally need to celebrate the sewage and our open drains so that you could use open drains for sewage treatment. You need to plan in a way that your septic tanks are improved and you don't wish them away. You need to treat locally so that you can use the treated wastewater locally. And the fifth agenda then is to redesign the flush toilet. Redesign it for re reuse. Close the nitrogen phosphorus cycle so that you can actually use human resource, human waste as a resource. And in all this, the most important challenge will be that you will need humble engineering. You will need to recognize the fact that Current technologies for sustainability are unaffordable. They're designed for the rich when you are rich. But we need affordable and su sustainable solutions. And this is where we need to go back to all the systems that we have discounted, the unproductive systems that we believe of the poor. And in the new engineering for the future, you will need to make sure that it is not arrogant science, but it is humble engineering, which can learn from the wisdom of how people manage resources frugally and rationally and build much more productive systems for the future. And the last agenda is really to learn this engineering from the art and science of nature. I come from a country with the monsoons. I come from a country where nature uses such a weak form of energy and yet transports 40,000 billion tons of water over long distances with such a small temperature difference to make it a monsoon. It's a weak source of energy. And yet, we use concentrated energy. We use water stored in reservoirs. We use coal, which, um, from, which has been stored over time. What we need to do is to learn from nature and to move towards these weaker sources of energy. And if we want to do that, we really need to learn from nature and not to unravel nature. We need to imitate nature for sustainable development. So at the end, 
I think as water engineers, we need to learn a few slogans. Catch water where it falls. Flush, but do not forget. And most importantly, most importantly, for all of us who come from rich societies, the most important water manager's principle has to be frugality is not poverty. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sunita. You've given us so much to think about. Those are great challenges. And um, as you reflected on earlier, those challenges affect not just India, but parts of Canada, many parts of Africa, and other parts of the developing world. So um, Sunita's very graciously offered to answer some questions. You'll notice that we have microphones set up on both of the stairways one on my left and one on my right. And if you could come to the microphone so that everyone can hear your question, and we can also record the questions, that would be great. Um, and we're gonna rotate from the left microphone to the right microphone. So um, I don't see anyone at a microphone yet. Is there anyone who would like to be brave enough to ask the first question? Because I know there are many. Great, can you come down to the microphone please so we can hear your question, Rob? I really enjoyed that, Dr. Nari, and I could just see you leaning over the Minister of Water's desk and pounding on it. Uh, I, I, I actually had that in my mind. Um, and I have several questions, and I have to pick one. I don't want to be greedy. Uh, I'm going to go with the first one. I was waiting for you to say something, and then you finally said it. And I was wondering if you were going to say it. Uh, you had a point up that says, rivers will need water for ecological flow. And that showed up at about 5 o'clock, 9 minutes after 5, in your talk after a lot of other ground was covered and, and nothing you said up to that point suggested that there was any need or concern for ecological flows or that they were anything other than really, I would almost say a rich person's luxury. So mm -hmm. I guess I'm asking, so why, why did you say that? So in yeah. light of everything you said, yeah. why did you say that we need ecological flows? Is that something that India can afford? Can it afford not yeah. to be worried about ecological flows? I mean, what's the What's the thinking in, in, the, in your world? That's a very good question. And you know, quite honestly, uh, ecological flow is today becoming an issue of concern also because of assimilation, the lack of capacity in, in our rivers to assimilate waste. So it is not ecological flow for nature's sake. It is ecological flow for management of waste and pollution. And I think that's particular in countries like ours where the imperative is supplying clean water in making sure there is enough for the competing needs of water between um, um, industry, agriculture, and the millions of people who still don't even have access to it, that the obsession of all of us is how do we first get that right? Uh, there is only a part of India where the issue of ecological flow has become a very important issue and that's water for rivers um, in the true sense, is in the upper Himalayan areas where you're beginning to see a huge number of run of the river projects, uh, hydro uh, projects. And those projects have been so badly designed that you take, you, where one project ends, another project begins. So you have bumper to bumper hydroelectric projects and you actually have stretches of the river which go dry. And so there the issue is, how do you make sure that the river keeps flowing for, 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 for the fact that you cannot kill rivers? But in most, I think the most, for me as, a, as somebody who takes many of these issues from a strategic point of view, as something where can I get the maximum um, policy influence and change in, I am seeing now being, because the cost of waste treatment is so high, we are 
finally beginning to recognize the fact that our rivers will need water to assimilate our waste. And if I can even get that to be understood, at least you don't kill your rivers. So that's the sort of long of what you asked. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sunita. Uh, I'm really fortunate to have you here, especially a leading Indian uh, environmentalist and, as well as a policymaker. And I would, I'm uh, from the same place as you. I'm just uh, from your neighbor country, Bangladesh. And I would like to ask you a couple of questions. The first of all, I think most of you do not know that 90% of the river which is following uh, through Bangladesh is directly or indirectly originated from India. And now the thing is that, in, uh, you know, you might be very aware of it that due to the construction of Paraka Dam on the Ganges River at the upstream of the Bangladesh, already 20% of the area have gone through a reversible, irreversible ecological damage, and it is already desertified. And now India have taken some initiative to river linking project to, di to divert water from east to west. As a downstream country person and as well as a representative from a poor country, people, uh, I would like to ask you, you were talking from the beginning that you are showing picture of your crying farmer. You were talking in your whole talk, the water security as well as the violence due to water shortage. Now, my question is that how can Bangladesh ensure their fair share of water from those rivers which is coming to my country? And I think you were the right person to ask this question because you were the leading, I think, in, uh, you were leading an organization, and especially which you know is Center for Science and Environment. So I am, uh, so I want uh, what your government is thinking and how you are helping your gov government about these issues. Because as just one, the last but not least, you're talking about that the violence and as well as the regional security. If e, my country's farmer are evicted or they cannot cultivate the crop, then how can your country ensure the regional security? Thanks. Um, it's a question that I always get from um, at, um, and I think it's a very, very important question from Bangladesh. It's a very important question from anybody who lives downstream of a river. Uh, you're from Bangladesh, so I can give you a bit of a sense of the geography and you will, you will appreciate the point I'm making. If you look at Arunachal, you look at Assam, their Brahmaputra comes from China and they're asking exactly the same question that Bangladesh is asking. Bihar gets its rivers from Nepal. Uh, Bihar is asking the same questions of Nepal. Any country which lives downstream is, has full right to ask and should ask uh, what will happen if you build a dam or a barrage upstream of my water source. Transboundary water management is one of the most political issues in the world. It is one of the most contentious issues in the world. And I don't think anybody has found any solution to it. But I would really encourage you that we need to go beyond this because every time we focus on the Farakka Barrage, what Bangladesh forgets is how you are completely destroying your own water system in Bangladesh itself. If you have been to Dhaka recently, I have been to Dhaka recently. We actually have a huge amount of work that we are doing in Bangladesh with Bangladesh groups, 
with Bangladeshi groups, because one of your biggest crises today is you are also very groundwater dependent. And your groundwater levels are falling, and they're falling also because of exactly as I showed what is happening in Indian cities. You're destroying your lakes, your ponds. Have you been to Dhaka recently? You would have seen all your, new, your lakes and your ponds have been destroyed today to, to do what we have done in our cities, which is to build. Buildings, residential building, malls, whatever else. So I think it's important, as much as we look at transboundary water sharing, which frankly I can do very little about, that is between the governments, they need to sort out how they will manage between Tista or they will manage between Farakka. But what I can certainly urge is that if you can get your local water systems much better repaired, much better thought about, if you can look at how you can increase your own productivity of agriculture using less water, exactly the challenges that Indian farmers have, then you build a water secure future, we build a water secure future. So I would argue that as much as Farakka is important, I think local water management is equally important. You are talking about the ground order. So I am, unfortunately, I am coming from the same part where the Tista barrage is. And I would like to inform you we have been, especially the, I think more than uh, the three district, the former have been using the surface water during the dry season from the Tista Dam. Now, since you have built a massive dam irrigation for the, to convert the, and diversifying only just 20 kilometer upstream of the Tista Dam, we are no longer getting any water and the, all the farmer from the three district now start using the groundwater. So still, we are not responsible so for exploiting. So how much is your rainfall? Our, sorry. How much is your rainfall over there? Uh, in the northern About part. About a thousand millimeters. Oh, uh, I think. Uh, Even uh, higher. One thousand. Uh, Even yeah. higher. One thousand. No, the question is. No, that no. So the question I'm asking is: Listen, I'm very clear, mm -hmm. and I'll be very rude and blunt over here. I can do nothing about the dams, either my government is building or your government is building, okay? Yeah. But I can certainly advise you in Bangladesh mm -hmm. that instead of constantly looking at only the question of dams, focus on what you can do with your own water management. You have massive endowment of rainwater. You are not using it. So you are using groundwater. You are not replenishing your groundwater systems as well. So please don't get me wrong. I'm not defending the Indian government, but I'm certainly defending the lack of application that either you have in Bangladesh or we have in India to look at water management in a much more comprehensive way. We are still focused on surface water. We are still focused on reservoirs. We don't look at the endowment of rainwater. So that's the point I'm making. I think okay. Rob DeLow was right. I would hate to be across the table from you because yeah. I know I would lose <laughs> another question on the other side. Good afternoon and thank you for the talk. It was very, very interesting. We heard um, from a couple of other speakers earlier today about some of the challenges uh, faced by international development workers um, in creating context appropriate solutions. So I guess my, my major question for you is what do you think that the role is of NGOs and organizations like the UN or development agencies in uh, finding this future that you've sort of painted for us? You know, their role is critical. They have the money. So uh, I have no doubt that they bring to the table huge finances which transform, uh, which have the potential of transforming uh, the way we manage our water or the way we manage our waste. I think the role is more critical of people in this room. If we can get our research agenda right, if we can start understanding these issues, we can inform these agencies not to make mistakes. Because if you think of the number of sewage treatment plants that have been built in our part of the world, which are today standing as white elephants, because where there is a sewage treatment plant, there is no sewage. We forgot the fact that we didn't have the interception um, system 
in our cities. Um, we need to be able to get those things right. And that will only come if you have more research, you have more understanding of what's happening, and you have an ability to look also for the different paradigm. I mean, for instance, I, I talk a lot in, when I'm in India about how we need to be able to do in situ treatment of our drains um, for sewage management. But those technologies are still very nascent. They are small. We haven't done enough research to be able to say that you could actually take a whole city's waste and turn it into a resource as I, as I would like to see it happen. And that will only happen if we start at least accepting the fact that the current systems are not working and we start seriously looking at alternatives. And if we can do that, we can inform these agencies and they won't make the mistakes and spend all our money with more waste down the river. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, I also have a whole number of questions I could ask, but I'm going to go back to a part in your talk where you were talking about uh, food systems and how there have been changes in what's being grown to crops that aren't necessarily sustainable and that this is occurring because of um, industrialized agriculture or global food systems. And I'm just wondering if you have any ideas about ways that there, ways that uh, we could start subverting that, so to move back towards growing crops that maybe are sustainable for the climate conditions. Oh, that's a very tough question. But, you know, I keep saying, um, I was eating with Bob yesterday in the restaurant, and I was looking at the menu, and you had this uh, description of uh, chicken, I think it was, which was that it was farm reared, no, it was beef. It was, uh, it was, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it was grass, uh, um, grass fed, open, reared, um, you know, it was a particular, it had this huge description. I was reading it and saying, well, that's what Indian farmers do right now. I mean, <laughs> most of our beef and most of our cattle is, is left to graze in the open. But we are changing our systems so that they become intensive agricultural systems. We go back. We, and then when we become fat and we could become rich and we start learning the value of organic agriculture, we then go back into organic. But we do organic agriculture today. We actually eat good food in our uh, societies today. We just don't value it. And so I think, again, like everything, uh, in some senses, if we can start valuing these systems, not once you have lost them, but before you have lost them. And to me, that's the biggest challenge we have. And, you know, it, it's difficult to explain this, but it's so fast that society loses knowledge. I mean, when I look at how we managed our rainwater harvesting systems, the fact that in one generation, we've absolutely lost the ability to capture rain and to hold it. I, one generation, we've lost the ability to eat millets. We think that that is for animals. We'll eat polished white rice. So it's, if we could do that in one generation, then my hope also is, can we turn it back in one generation? And I think that's really where the biggest message is. The problem is that agriculture is no longer in your and my hands. It's not in farmers' hands either. Agriculture and the food system is really in the hands of very large agribusiness. And the question then becomes even tougher. How do you get them to actually do this seriously? Uh, not in a way that it would be a little bit of greenwash only. And I think that's where we as consumers will have to play a very big role. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for a, a very stimulating presentation. Uh, my name is Robert Case. I'm uh, an assistant professor in social development studies. Uh, my background is social work. And as such, I don't understand half of the science that's going on here among these people in the room. I'm glad people are doing it with people with bigger brains than mine. Um, but also as such, I'm interested to know 
um, where you see, where's the role of grassroots mobilization, the social movements, and even that sort of conflict politics, you know, like the anti-dam movements in, uh, in India, for example, where, where does that become part of moving the agenda forward? When does it become an impediment to moving the agenda forward? When does it trap people in old ways? When does it recover the lost knowledge and, and present innovation? I, I'm wondering if you can just kind of comment broadly on, on that. Oh, that's a very tough question. But let me answer it. Um, you know, India is, um, we've got huge numbers of such what I call pollution mutinies, which are um, communities of people who are fighting for their right to clean water, um, um, not destroy their livelihoods by building a dam, which would lead to displacement, uh, building a thermal power plant, which will pollute their air, or a mine which would uh, destroy their water system. So we have a large number of such community um, um, groups who are protesting, agitating, and in my view, they actually help us as, as India and as Indians to keep demanding that we will have to do much more with much less. And the fact is that those community groups are putting a certain pressure on, on policy, on the way we do extraction of our minerals, in, to, to be able to say that no, you will not get all the coal uh, which is under the forest because we need the forest for our survival. You will not be able to build all the dams because you cannot displace us. You will have to find alternate energy systems which are not so destructive. So in that sense, I think the, 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 the million pollution mutinies, as I call them, um, help to keep India um, um, in ways that we will become much more sustainable because we will have to provide for all. But the problem is, and that's the good thing, but the problem is that the entire debate on what to do and what not to do also ends up becoming extremely polarized. And this debate between whether we build a dam or whether we don't build a dam, whether we do this or we don't do this, there is no space to really look at how do we move forward in a way that we can balance the two needs of, of so-called development with the needs of livelihoods and the needs of sustainability. And that then demands a very high order of being able to listen to people, to be able to understand what people are saying, and yet to be able to design things differently so that you can both have growth, but you can provide for local people as well. And that resolution of conflict is not easy when the alternatives are not so easy. You really don't have such easy answers in terms of, um, of, of doing development because the rest of the world has done development by throwing out people, by getting rid of uh, its pristine forests, by essentially cutting, moving, and replacing. We don't have those options. So in that sense, for us, and I think that's what makes India so exciting, that's, what, that's why I, I would never be able to work anywhere else is because we will have to be able to find those different answers in which we will be able to provide for people and yet have growth in the way we, the rest of the world knows it. And that's the balance, the challenge of the balance that I think these movements help us to think about. So thank you. Thanks very much, Robert. I think that was a great question to finish on. That's my little alarm to remind me that uh, we're, we need to finish up because there's a wonderful reception waiting for you right outside those doors. So it's my great pleasure on behalf of the Water Institute to thank Sunita for coming today. Thank you very and much. And for challenging our thinking. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.